me give you the turn on your mic and uh, audio, but. I think you have to turn on your audio. That does yeah. that work? Yeah, I can hear you. I can't see you though. Okay, now the seeing. Let's start the video. Come on. There we there go. There you go. It's working. <laughs> okay. So, sorry for the uh, mess up on the email. Oh, don't the worry email. about it. Don't worry about it. It's. It takes a little getting used to. Yeah, that's okay. my excuse. Okay, well, that's... Well, great to have you on again. I hope you've been keeping well. Yeah, I have, yeah. Oh, um, that's good. Life is always full of something or the other. That's good. So, um, <clears throat> we wanted to talk a little bit about Margaret Barker. Yeah, Um I'm not sure, like, you said you had, like, a presentation. I'm not sure, like, you just want to talk or you have any slides or however well, you go about well, it. Well, I do have I do have some slides that I if could. If that's the case, I'll let you be able to share a screen. Um, so. Get to my PowerPoint here. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Um, yeah, because I was reached out by someone who follows my podcast, and they were uh, they asked if I could have someone who's for and against Barker and her interpretation of the uh, deuteronomistic reforms and um, yeah. King Josiah. So okay. I thought that would be a good idea. Like, um, I'm in talks with a professor from BYU who would be more critical of Barker's reading of the yeah. sources. Um, yeah. Tyler Halverson. So he'll be coming on later, but I thought I'd reach out to you because you've written a lot about it. So uh, I yeah. thought you would be yeah. the first person to give okay. the um, con Josiah pro Barker interpretation, if you yeah. will. Well, like I, I just got through reading um, or through doing a review of, say, uh, of uh, Grant Hardy's annotated Book of Mormon, you know, which is it's a very good book. <clears throat> but when it comes to Barker, he basically dismisses her as controversial, one line, one label. And then he says that the Book of Mormon is basically adopts a Deuteronomistic outlook uh, because it has that if you're obedient, you'll be blessed. And if you're disobedient, you'll be cursed. And that's repeated 19 times, he says. And for him, that's the whole case. And um, <clears throat> my case is uh, you got to pay attention to a, a lot more than that. And that yeah. is uh, you know, when Josiah sends the high priest into the temple to take out the tree of life, to burn it, to crush the ashes and to scatter the ashes on the graves, to uh, to desecrate it. And then you compare that with, say, Lehi going out and having a vision of the tree of life. We ought to see a connection. And there's the there's the instance that say the uh, that the Bible, as we have it, like uh Richard, the, the first thing that I read that filled me in on Josiah was Richard Elliott Friedman's Who Wrote the Bible, where he's making the case that, that, that a big chunk of the Bible, the Deuteronomistic history, was written specifically for King Josiah that was edited and prepared in his lifetime. And then after he was killed, there were additions made to kind of, you know, to, to report subsequent events and also to, to blame, you know, cast blame for what went wrong. So he's central, and, uh, and culturally in the church, we just really haven't paid any attention. You know, because I, I don't remember ever having a lesson about Josiah, barely having heard mentioned, and that, that then I read uh, Friedman. So that was the background that I had. And then after I after I read The Great Angel, I decided I need to know some more about this. And so I got a, you know several other books I've got up here. But um, most of them just basically take it for granted that... Uh, that Josiah was the good guy because that's what the book says, and you know it's the Bible, so you, you take it at its word. And then you come along and you read things uh, in the Great Angel and her other books, and especially when she came to BYU in two thousand three, and she made she made there's a statement that she made there that that uh, <clears throat> that Josiah's changes concerned the high priest and were thus changes at the very heart of the temple. So that made me go back. And so, like when I wrote Paradigms Regained, when I wrote this guy, 
I was kind of drawing on Friedman and seeing the reform happen on layers. But when I heard her talk at BYU, I started, you know, went back and took another look at things and started reading Jeremiah really closely. And uh, the thing to notice about Jeremiah, he's called the year after the, re the year after the reform starts. So Josiah is made king when he's eight years old. His father, Ammon, is killed. The people of the land supposedly kill the people that, that, that killed Ammon, and then they make Josiah king when he's eight years old. When Josiah comes of age, he's uh, 20, 21 years old, he launches the reform. The year after that is when Jeremiah is called. So the reform was not launched by the prophets. The reform was launched by the kings. And Jeremiah is called the year after the reform, the year after the reform begins, and he's called against the kings, against the priests, against the prophets, and against the people of the land who installed Josiah. And it doesn't give an exception for Josiah. And then there's a, another key thing is uh, Alan Goff published an article on uh, allusions and type scenes. And there's there's some differences in the uh, account in Second Kings of Josiah and in Chronicles. And I think the most important difference, you know, there are some differences, but the most important difference is that when the death of Josiah is described in Chronicles, there's a, a what they call a type scene. And the type scene is a disguise narrative where when they're going to the battle against the Egyptians, Josiah adopts a disguise so that he won't be recognized, but he's killed anyway. And the point is, is that uh, Goff makes the point that there are these uh, three different disguise narratives in the Bible, and they all involve a king, all involve adopting a disguise that immediately fails, and there, <clears throat> things always end badly. The kings in the disguise narratives are Saul, Jehoiakim, and Ahab. So you've got something subtle and interesting going on there where there's this unresolved tension where how come the most perfect king who ever lived is all of a sudden being associated with the ones that they think are the worst? You know, and I've never seen anybody discuss that. that much. So there's there's stuff going on. Uh, plus, uh, in uh, in the Older Testament, <clears throat> uh, Margaret starts making the case that that uh, the third Isaiah is deliberately responding to the to the Deuteronomist, and she says she read all of these other commentaries on on third Isaiah. And she says nobody pays any attention to who he's objecting to. She says, but if you start paying attention clearly the Deuteronomist. So there's a case to be made that there's something off. And for all the times I've seen people, you know, try and dismiss Barker, nobody really addresses the case. They just say, well, this stuff sounds Deuteronomistic. End of story. So anyway, I do have my little PowerPoint here. If oh, no, that's perfect. Uh, you mentioned like your uh, paper Paradigms Regained. I'll link to that in the show notes. I'll also yeah. link to your interpreter audio page because you have like a two-part response to criticisms yeah. of Barker as well. So yeah. I think that would be like a good overview. Um, but like for maybe listeners, like how did you get tuned into Barker's scholarship initially uh, and what got you interested in going down this kind of rabbit hole, if you will? Okay. Well, um, I've got in all my farms reviews up there and there are two different authors in the farms review that in reviews uh, there was an article criticizing book of mormon christology and two different reviewers uh both quoted from the great angel in it and they both quoted the same passage at least both of them quoted the same passage and then then uh, one of them quoted another one and they just kind of stuck on my head so i just they were there and then i was walking through a bookstore and you know, visiting my brother in dallas and he took me to this huge half price books. And I was just wandering around there and go to the religion section. And there is the only time I had ever seen any of Barker's books in an American bookstore or library anywhere. And I saw it. there's this, you know, some copies of the great angel. So I just reached up and I thought, yeah, that sounds like an interesting book. And this is, this is the most marked up and mangled book in my entire library. And I read it. And I started reading it. By the time I got halfway through, I was home and I called my brother and I said, go back to that bookstore and buy up every copy of that book and send them to me because this is something important. This needs to be shared. So I, I just realized that there's something going on here that really resonated with what we have in the Book of Mormon. And I think the thing that I did that was different, even other people had been quoting Barker before I did, but I just started, I just wanted to place it in the context. You've got Lehi in Jerusalem 600 BC and you've got Barker making her picture and 
<clears throat> the thing is, is you got Joseph Smith, uh, 23, 24 years old, dictating, you know, the, the Book of Mormon in two months. And you've got Barker, who when she was uh, like, I think, uh, 13 years old, asked for for her birthday. She wanted to have a, a Hebrew lexicon. And so she taught herself how to read Hebrew from that young age. She went to Cambridge and she studied this stuff. And she just realized that uh, at Cambridge, there's they they weren't they were treating the Old Testament, the New Testament, and early Christianity all as separate compartments with no continuity. They just weren't interested. And she also had come through a couple of reasons to think that there's neglect of the temple. One thing that uh, she told John Tibetanus was that when she was at Cambridge, she in the library she was reading through an issue of Jewish Quarterly Review and read an essay called Christian Envy of the Temple by one Hugh Nibley. <laughs> and that sort of pointed her this way. And there's some other things that um, aren't my story to tell uh, that kind of got her pointed toward the temple. But she came to, to decide that um, <clears throat> to understand Christianity, you had to go back to the first temple. You had to reconstruct what was going on in the first temple and that that would be the roots of Christianity. And it turns out, so you've got Margaret using her methods and her sources, you know, she's using things that weren't available to anybody anywhere. You know, she uses the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Pseudepigrapha and Apocrypha and, and Christian liturgy and uh, different editions of the Bible, the Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls versions and the Aramaic and the Babylonian talent. You know, she just, she just reads everything. And she comes up with her reconstruction, and Joseph Smith comes up with his, and they shouldn't fit, but they do. And none of the people that have uh, criticized Barker have ever accounted for that. And I think the best way to account for it is accuracy and common inspiration, because otherwise it's not just a few random parallels, it's this elaborate thing. When, uh, when I got... Uh, uh, the Great Angel, after I read it, and then I started tracking down everything else she'd written. And I was very, it was providential for me. The first time I went to the uh, library in Lawrence, Kansas, at uh, Kansas University, KU, I found a copy of the Older Testament. That was out of print, but there happened to be one in that <laughs> little college town I was living in. And I, you know, actually Xerox it so I can really work on it. But um, I contacted her in 1999 and I just I decided that when I was just I got her address through and I saw the name of one of the scholars that had written a blurb on the one of the back of her books and looked his address up on the net and asked him for her address and this guy provided it to me and then I wrote Margaret and as I was getting ready to wrote Margaret I had a picture of a bookstore that I'd been to a couple of months before and I'd seen a pristine copy of Enoch the Prophet there and I just had that picture flash into my head so I took that as a hint and went and bought that particular book and also uh, uh, The 40-Day Ministry by Hugh Nibley uh, because she has an essay called The Secret Tradition that covers basically, uses the same sources and covers the same ground. And I just thought she'd be interested. So I put those in a package, sent, her, sent them off to her. And uh, she writes back. <clears throat> this is the first contact. It's the 13th September, 1999. Uh, dear Kevin, thank you for the surprise package in your kind letter. I read everything with great interest. I know very little indeed about Mormon studies, so it was fascinating for me to discover these things for the first time. You will probably have realized by now that my books are a serial production. The Older Testament is the groundwork for everything that follows, and year by year I am setting out the picture as I see it. Unfortunately, there was no American edition of the Older Testament, so many American scholars have been confused by my work and even misrepresented it because they had missed the first episode, so to speak. There are also a number who do not like what I am doing because it questions what they are doing, and they have given me a pretty hard time. I have two, two more volumes in press. There is a commentary on Isaiah, which I now realize uh, will be a, uh, of great interest to Mormon studies. This is going to be part of the commentary 2000, but unless Erdman's hurry up, they will miss 2000. And there's a new reading of the book of Revelation due in a few months from TNT Clark Edinburgh, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. In addition, I have two books in progress. This is a big map. The Isaiah commentary shows that Isaiah presupposes not the Judaism of Moses and the Old Testament as we know it, but it is based on the Enoch cult of the first temple. 
The Revelation book argues that the original oracles of the book are from Jesus, who saw himself as the great Melchizedek, and so fueled the expectations of his time, and that his prophecies were a major factor in prompting the war against Rome. You did not tell me about your own special interests. I assume it must be in this area, but I should be interested to know in what you're working on. And I have, incidentally, an article on the secret tradition in the American Journal of Higher Criticism. All good wishes, Margaret Barker. So I told her then, well, I'm going to compare the Book of Mormon to your work. So I spent uh, the first year working. I, I run across Daniel Peterson at a we went to talk to him after he'd given a talk at the open house for the St. Louis Temple and asked him if anybody was working on Margaret Barker stuff. And he uh, he said you know, he was interested, but he didn't know who was working on it. So, But he put me in touch with Bill Hamlin, who was doing the occasional papers. So I wrote up a draft over a year and sent it to Hamlin, and he sent it back with like five sentences on it that kept me working for another year. And so two years of work, and then I sent Margaret a copy of this when it came out. And uh, and she emailed back. She says, it came about five hours ago. I've read it already, dot, 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 all uppercase. I had no idea that what I was doing was of such interest for Mormon studies. Thank you for sending me a copy. And for that matter, thank you for writing the book. And then after this, apparently, uh, Noel Reynolds had been working at a project at the Vatican Library and on the way fly fly back to Utah, he had a copy of The Great Angel and he read it. He thought he'd discovered Margaret. So he went into the farm's headquarters and he talked to Midgley and he said, uh, has anyone heard of Margaret Barker? And they said, oh yeah, we just published Kevin's book. (laughs) So and he later told me that my writing the book saved him the trouble. So I feel like that this was something that was going to happen, you know, whether I got to be part of it or not, but it was just going to happen. So then uh, he arranged through me, he arranged to go see her in England, and he spent about five hours with her talking about the temple. And after that, they invited her to BYU. So then she went to BYU in 2003. And there's a lot of interaction and meetings with different people there that have continued on. And then in 2005, they had her come to the Joseph Smith Conference, where she spoke on the Book of Mormon. And... There, that was at the Library of Congress. It was this huge full audience, and they would have these multiple speakers. And then after the the session, they'd send up questions. And for for that session, every question was directed to Margaret. I mean, it was clear that she really she'd really nailed it. She she just got people very very excited. And since then, there's been things like the uh, she started the Temple Studies program in uh, London and. Several LDS scholars started going there, and LDS scholars in Logan started the Academy for Temple Studies. So there's been this cross-fertilization of things that have been going on. Uh, When she was at BYU, she (coughs) started talking to, or Jack Welch was driving her around, and he just started, you know, they looked up at the mountains, and they said, yeah, the mountains are like the mountain of the Lord. And then Jack started saying, well, he's written a lot about the Sermon on the Mount as a temple, as a temple text. And she just paused and started asking more questions and eventually that led to the book that jack that she edited and she published she says i want you to do this you know like you've done for illuminating the sermon of the temple and the sermon on the mount i'd like you to do that for us and she did you know so he did he did it and it's it's just a great book and he's he's done more work since so uh i would periodically hear that you know lots and lots of different lds scholars have just been in contact with her she's always gracious always helpful uh one of my favorites is when Kevin Barney said he sent her his uh, his article on Joseph Smith's you know commentary on on Genesis one, and he said that she wrote back and approved and said the key to everything is what is missing from Genesis, <laughs> which is you know, to me sounds really good. But it's just been this this amazing phenomenon um, when she went to speak at. Uh, at Yonkers, she was invited by the Orthodox Church in America to go there to speak to the school where they teach all of their ministry. And the, the head of the Orthodox Church, uh, Metropolitan Jonah, was there and you know other notables and had you know, two or three hundred of these very learned uh, Orthodox priests. And and uh, they treated, my wife and I went up there and they kind of quickly sussed out that we were LDS. They treated us like visiting dignitaries. And then after uh, she gave the talk on Jesus as the great high priest, 
Um, for the live presentation, the first question that was asked, you know, there's one guy just went up, he just looked real um, indignant and says, well, what do you think about Jesus? And she said, Jesus is everything to me. I preach, you know, this every Sunday, you know, for her, it's a real thing, not just an academic exercise. But something went wrong, so they had to have her read the talk again for the radio broadcast. And for the radio broadcast, so the first question they asked her was, what is it about about you and the Mormons. And so she said, well, it's because, you know, the temple, she says, they had the, if you're serious about the temple, you should ask the Mormons uh, because they have the best scholars on the temple bar none. So she hasn't backed down from the connection in the slightest. Um, I had a, shortly before the, the seminar, I got an email from uh, M. Catherine Thomas, who's a brilliant scholar in the church. She wasn't able to go to the seminar because she had to be elsewhere, but she asked, she she just wondered, how is this, you know, she's just you know, basically come from nowhere and just getting accepted. She was elected to the presidency of the uh, Society for Old Testament Study in England, where you have to know Hebrew to get in, you know, and then she, they, they had her be the president. She's edited several lines of books. Uh, and uh, I really lost my thought there. But, um, oh, she said, how's she going to react? That was this, and Catherine Thomas kind of said, how's she going to react? You know, she's just getting accepted. She's just, and we show up. How's, how's she going to react? And she's just never blushed or backed down. She's been upfront about it the whole time. She mentions this on her website. And the interest that we've had in this book, you know, she said, this is the book that got the Mormons interested. So she's just always been up front and been collaborating. And she's, she's, uh, she's been in the, you know, spoken at not only BYU and 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 Logan, but also at uh, the LA Temple, the visitor center there. She's been there for things. Jack invited her for the uh, dedication of the, uh, I think it was first was the Paris Temple, and they took her through there for a special tour. She was so impressed. She just said everything's ancient, but the electric lights. And then a couple of years later, for the uh, dedication of the Rome Temple, she called Jack and she said. Uh, would it be too much trouble if we did it again in Rome? If you look at her websites for those years, she, she both in Rome and in Paris, she gave talks on being in the temple. You know, she didn't mention us, but everything she says, because we're so temple-centered, it, it's directly relevant to what we're interested in. So um, I just think that the whole thing with Barker has been phenomenal. And from Paradigms Regained On, from my first publication on this on, I believe that her work is literally the fulfillment of the prophecy in First Nephi 13 about the restoration of plain and precious things, specifically handy dandy missionary scriptures out here. It's very specific about what's going to come back. Okay. <clears throat> So it gives the it gives the sequence. There's plain and precious things are going to be taken away, and then other books are going to come by the power of the Lamb, and to the convincing the Gentiles and the remnant of the seed of my brethren, and also the Jews upon the face of the earth, that the records of the prophets and the twelve apostles are true. And the angel spake unto me, saying, These last records which thou hast seen among the Gentiles shall establish the truth of the first, which are of the twelve apostles of the Lamb, and shall make known the plain and precious things which have been taken away from them. And shall make known to all kindreds, tongues, and people that the Lamb of God is the Son of the Eternal Father and the Savior of the world, and that all men must come unto him or they cannot be saved. Well, that's, that's the thesis of this book. You know, so it is a literal fulfillment of that specific prophecy using sources that have come in exactly the same way. So it's not just a little kind of, yeah, yeah, I can kind of see that. It's, it's very specific. And uh, I think I'm still astounded by all of this and to be, you know, a little bit part of it. And it's been uh, exciting to see other people picking up on this work and doing interesting things with it, you know, like uh, Val Larson lately or uh, Alison von Felt did some really good things. And, you know, there's there have been several that have been using it. Uh, Neil Rapley's done some good, some good stuff extending it out. So it's not just me. It's people that have really got the credentials. David Larson's been involved in doing this, too. And um so she's 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 the real deal, and um, I take it very seriously. And you know, one of the reasons, say, that I wrote uh, the twenty years after article for Interpreter is because I was seeing a few people that were just 
poo-pooing it. You know, just weren't taking it seriously. Like that BYU studies article specifically where he just kind of you know, brushes her aside. Um, and so I just, I had to <laughs> put on my waders and go after it. No, I think that's a good uh, background to like say uh, your interest in studies. And you would say like, it's not simply like say a stray parallel or two. It's basically the bar from the language of Gardner and others. It's like, it's a convergence from all these various aspects yeah. of her scholarship vis-a-vis -vis, like the temple and the day Saint scripture, especially the Book of Mormon's pre-exilic uh, background. Yeah, it's the right time, the right place, the right doctrine, the right information. And it's just, and it's fruitful. It's, it's you know, things like, uh, you know, the, uh, that Jack did with her with the temple book and the stuff that he's done since he's kept working on it. You know, that was others uh, that uh, the Academy of Temple Studies did that wonderful volume on uh, Mormonism in the temple. I think it's uh, 2011, 2012 or so. And I, I quoted from that quite a bit. And there's some really good stories there where Margaret tells her story and Jack tells his and several other people about their interactions and Dan Peterson and all of this. Uh, so it's the, just the fruitfulness of it. And that the closer we look, the more exciting it gets. And the people that are critical, basically, they, they're not giving a close look. They're just basically saying, well, have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on her? Well, it turns out, yeah, they do. You know, I've seen it. I've, I've heard them. I've got, I was able to quote from N.T. Wright, you know, talking about what she's done. And uh, and uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury awarding her the her Lambeth Doctor of Divinity and the Queen of England, you know, involved in this. And the, uh, the head of the Orthodox Church writing an introduction to one of her books. Um, you know, so there's, there are, and it's the people that are, that really like her work are the ones that really are believers, you know, that really believe all of this is real and have a faith in a living Christ, not just as an academic exercise, you know, where you go to university and, and uh, write critical things and kind of tear apart the gospel. And then, you know, she says, then go to the even song. Um, it's, it's the people that she gives them a Jesus that they can not only accept as scholars, but they can have faith in as believers. And that's those are the kind of people that like her work, that are really into this as, as a personal testimony that they have. And I think that uh, the Mormon connection for her is completely unexpected. You know, she said she had no idea. And we had no idea either. We just, we just, see all of this that comes together in such a powerful way you know uh, and the people that have taken it further than i have like uh, Val, Val larson and daniel rapley that have you know have skills that i don't but uh so they take it further and so it's it's not just that i saw there was to see back 20 years ago it's it keeps on being fruitful no that's that's good um just in terms of my background, like um, I heard of Margaret Barker. Um, I first read her book, The Great Angel, back in 2004 when I started university. And I think it was around this time when I heard about your work and um, read the occasional paper as well. So as I said, for those who are listening to this episode, the occasional paper is linked below as alongside mm -hmm. Kevin's author page on the Interpreter website, where you'll see his two-part response to various criticisms of Barker from LDS and non-LDS as well. But um yeah, that's that's kind of a good overview. So, like, do you want to start your presentation now? If you oh, well, probably won't be able to do the whole thing, but we can we can do some. Let's see. Okay, it's here. If you want to, you're going to share the screen with me. Oh, you can share. Uh, you should be able to share the screen. Okay, so you want yeah. to share my screen? Yep. Yep. Okay, I'm going to share that, and we're going to go with this guy, and from the beginning. Okay, can you see I'll that? Just mute myself. Yeah, I can see it. So I'll just mute myself and I'll let you uh, go as long as you want. Okay. So this is like, I did a fireside on this, but I say, this is just some of the background that she's, uh, I'll go back. To it. She she got her, her doctorate for a significant new contribution to our understanding of the New Testament and opening up important fields for research. She's just not saying what everybody else is saying. And she's basically says, the Christians saw themselves as restoring Solomon's temple and Christian theology grew rapidly around this fundamental claim you know, so then you've got solomon's temple and that's built by solomon 950 bc reformed by josiah in 621 bc which means when lehi was alive i think he was very young i think uh i think he was probably born around the time that the reform began and that he his oldest sons were born at, toward the end of josiah's life and that they grew up during uh, when jehoiakim was king so you'd have 
Nephi being, you know, young, very young, but large in stature. So it's probably around 14 years old. Um, it gets destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar 587 BC, or BC after Lehi left Jerusalem. So much smaller than Herod's temple, but the idea of it, and she's making a case that provides the background for contemporary Christianity. It's the source and or the second temple is the background for when Christianity happened, but the first temple was the source and inspiration. And so she's written a lot of books by now. And uh, she says, temple theology is the original context of the New Testament insofar as the hopes, beliefs, symbols, and rituals of the temple shaped the lives of those who came to be called Christians. In new of incarnation and atonement, the sons of God, the life of the age to come, the day of judgment, justification, salvation, the renewed covenant, and the kingdom of God. When temple theology is presented, even in barest outline, its striking relevance to the New Testament becomes clear. So she says, for the temple, there's going to be evidence for the temple as a place of creation and renewal. These themes center upon the Garden of Eden, which the temple was built to represent. There will be evidence for the temple as a place of mediation and atonement, themes associated with the veil of the temple, which symbolize the boundary between the material and spiritual world. And third, there will be evidence of the temple as a place where some could pass beyond the veil and experience the vision of God, seeing into the essence of all things past, present, and future. I, of course, think of Truth is knowledge of things as they are, as they were, and as they are to come. And then she talks about, this is an important one. The anointed high priest of the first temple was remembered as having been different from the high priest of the second temple cult, since the latter was described simply as the priest who wears many garments, a reference to the eight garments worn by him on Yom Kippur. And who is the anointed high priest? He that is anointed with the oil of unction, but not he that is dedicated with the many garments. And she says, this is from the great angel, page 15. It is also remembered that the roles of the anointed high priest and the high priest of the many gardens differed in some respects at Yom Kippur when the rituals of atonement were performed. The anointed high priest, they believed, would be restored to Israel at the end of time in the last days. So the early Christians who used the Greek text of the Psalm 110, becoming Melchizedek priest, mean, meant being born as the son among the angels. In temple terms, this is a ritual in the Holy of Holies, in the place of the angels in which the human becomes divine. The Holy of Holies represented the state of creation that was both beyond and before the material creation. And this was where the Melchizedek priest was born. The rest of Psalm 110.3 has become opaque in the Hebrew. And we have to ask why this might have happened. I suggest this was it was because this verse described the making of the ancient Melchizedek priests who were described as sons of God. So she can say, <clears throat> what was assumed by the New Testament writers was a traditional understanding of the temple rituals and the myths of atonement. When the rituals had ceased and the myths were no longer recognized for what they really were, the key to understanding the imagery of atonement was lost. It's from the atonement rite of healing. So we've got the crucial time. And this is what she says at the end of the, the introduction of her first book in 1987. The life and work of Jesus were and should be interpreted in light of something other than Jerusalem Judaism. This other had its roots in the conflicts of the 6th century BC, when the traditions of the monarchy were divided as an inheritance among several heirs. It would have been lost but for the accidents of archaeological discovery and the evidence of pre-Christian texts preserved and transmitted only by Christian hands. It's from the Old Testament. And Nephi, I just was reading this, these last records, other books besides the Bible and the Book of Mormon, which thou hast seen among the Gentiles, shall establish the truth of the first, which are of the twelve apostles of the Lamb, and shall make known the plain and precious things which have been taken away from them, and shall make known to all kindreds, tongues, and people that the Lamb of God is the Son of the Eternal Father and the Savior of the world, and that all men must come unto him, or they cannot be saved. So <clears throat> we have to pay attention to the reforms of Josiah. Look at the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians. There's, there's been increasing recognition during you know, my lifetime that this as a period was crucial for the formation of much of the Hebrew Bible. So the Bible says uh, his father Ammon was killed when he was eight. Now, I think it's interesting here just too that uh, Ammon is a Book of Mormon name, but Josiah isn't. Why is that? He was installed as king by people of the land. Uh, I think the meaning of that phrase changes over the years, but I think at the time of Josiah, that would have been the landowners. That would have been the people who had power and influence and ambitions. He launched a violent reform in the 12th year of his reign, either as a response to the discovery of the Book of the Law, that's how 2 Kings 
puts it, or during a reform that led to that discovery during a renovation of the temple. That's how Sacred Chronicles puts it. He was killed in battle by the Egyptian Necho at age 39. Father of Jehoiakim, who was installed by Egyptians, and Zedekiah, installed by the Babylonians. And there was two other sons of Josiah that had the three-month terms, so I, I don't pay attention to them much. The Bible says he is the best king since Moses. According to Friedman's Who Wrote the Bible, an edition of the Deuteronomist history was written during his reign to honor him. Subsequent editions to the histories deal with his unexpected death, the reigns of Jehoiakim and Zedekiah, and the destruction of the Jerusalem temple and the exile. It's described in 2 Kings 22-23, with some significant variations in 2 Chronicles 34-35. It's associated with the Book of the Law, which was a version of Deuteronomy. And they removed the Asherah, the tree of life from the Holy of Holies, and destroyed it. And it involved public violence against existing priests, including destruction and killing. And he slew all the priests of the high places. Jeremiah observes that your own sword hath destroyed your prophets like a destroying lion. In thy skirts is found the blood of poor innocents. I have not found it by secret search, but upon all of these. So this is, they're talking about public violence. And the only biblical account of extensive public violence against re religious figures in Israel during the period to compare with Jer Jeremiah's report and Lehi's report, by the way, is Josiah's reform. And Je Jeremiah is called after the, the reform began against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. People of the land, of course, being the ones that installed Josiah and the others being the ones who were involved in, uh, in the reform right at that time. And you can get that. There's a, a chapter in Ezekiel that goes through all of the same groups of people and gives more details on what they're doing wrong. And also, I think uh, Zechariah does the same thing. In Who Wrote the Bible, Friedman declared that Jeremiah agrees with the Deuteronomic history on practically every important point and agrees with Deuteronomy on virtually every point. That presumes you don't have to ask any further questions about what's important. So, uh, in fact, this is what Grant Hardy says. Uh, he says, you know, he says the, the Book of Mormon takes a basically Deuteronomistic approach uh, with a frequent you know, promise, in as much as you keep my commandments, you shall prosper in the land, in as much as you will not keep my commandments, you shall be cut off from his presence. And then he points out there's, uh, that's 1 Nephi, or 2 Nephi 120 and 19 additional citations. But there's other stuff going on. And, uh, of course, he's, you know, this is Hardy saying he thinks that uh, if the Book of Mormon is anti-Deuteronomic, that's counter to the ethos of the Book of Mormon as a whole. But he doesn't really engage my work or hers, actually. So, is that all that's going on? And I say, given that Jeremiah and Nephite authors show a detailed knowledge of and respect for Deuteronomy, that implies that any contradiction they make is both deliberate and significant. So let's take a look and let's see what's going on. This is from Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. He has a chapter in there called The Invisibility of Revolutions. And he says, for reasons that are both obvious and highly functional, science textbooks and too many of the older histories of science refer only to the part of the work of past scientists that can easily be viewed as contributions to the statement and solution of the text's paradigm problems. Partly by selection and partly by distortion, the scientists of earlier ages are implicitly represented as having worked upon the same set of fixed problems and in accordance with the same set of fixed canons that the most recent revolution in scientific theory and method has made seem scientific. No wonder that textbooks and the historical tradition they imply have to be rewritten after each scientific revolution. And no wonder that as they are rewritten, science once again comes to seem largely cumulative. So, we have a new history written specifically to honor Josiah and, this is important, to dishonor those who became who came before. Are Barker's suggestions unthinkable that the histories were edited to depict earlier ages as having worked upon the same set of fixed problems and in accordance with the same set of fixed canons that Josiah's revolution made seem orthodox? And this is what she said at BYU, Josiah's changes concerned the high priests and were thus changes at the very heart of the temple. What Josiah purged from his kingdom and from the temple in Jerusalem was not a forbidden Canaanite cult. It was the religion of the patriarchs as described in Genesis. 
First, they were to have the law instead of wisdom. It's Deuteronomy 4, 6. What was the wisdom that the law replaced? Second, they were to think only of the formless voice of God sounding from the fire and giving the law. Deuteronomy 19, 12. Israel had long had a belief in the vision of God when the glory had been visible on the throne in human form, surrounded by the heavenly hosts. What happened to the visions of God? And third, they were to leave the veneration of the host of heaven to peoples not chosen by Yahweh. Deuteronomy 4, 19 to 20. Israel had long regarded Yahweh as the Lord of hosts of heaven, Lord of the hosts of heaven, but the title Yahweh of hosts was not used by the Deuteronomists. What happened to the hosts, the angels? In the revelation of Jesus Christ, she added references to two other Deuteronomic prescriptions. The Jews were not to inquire after the secret things which belonged only to the Lord, that's Deuteronomy 29.9. Their duty was to obey the commandments brought down from Sinai, and not to seek someone who would ascend to heaven for them to discover remote and hidden things, Deuteronomy 30, 11. Deuteronomy 16 lists the festivals as Passover, weeks, and tabernacles. No day of atonement. And this is Barker again. Later tradi tradition remembers that the oil of anointing was lost when the temple was destroyed, which means the high priest became the priest of the many colored robes rather than the anointed. Messiah and Christ both mean anointed. So there's a conflict between law and vision, and she says this can most can be demonstrated most easily by comparing Exodus 24.10 and Deuteronomy 4.12. The Exodus text describes the events on Mount Sinai. The elders saw the God of Israel on his throne, presumably in a vision. This vision of God, exactly like that seen by Isaiah in Isaiah 6, Ezekiel, and John. The Deuteronomy text wants none of this and emphasizes that there was only a voice at Sinai. The presence of the Lord was not a vision to inspire them, but a voice giving commands that had to be obeyed. The tension between word and vision was also a tension between the new and the old, between the law-based religion and the temple-based religion. It can be traced all through the Bible. That's from On Earth as it is in Heaven, page 4. So we get this in Sherman Jacob. Sherem says, thou goest about much, preaching that which you call the gospel or doctrine of Christ. And ye have led away much of this people that they might pervert, uh, pervert the right way of God and keep not the law of Moses, which is the right way. To which Jacob responds, I have heard and seen, and it has also been made manifest unto me by the power of the Holy Ghost. Wherefore, I know if there should be no atonement made, all mankind must be lost. Deuteronomy has the law as replacing wisdom. Keep therefore and do them, that is, the statutes and judgments of the law. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of all nations, which shall hear these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Deuteronomy 4.6. Jeremiah, I think here, is directly responding to that verse. How do ye say we are wise and Yahweh's Torah is with us? In fact, it was made for a lie, the lying pen of the scribes. That's how Friedman translates it. It's a bit harsher than the King, King James Version. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord, and what wisdom is in them? Jeremiah 8, 8 to 9. Deuteronomy on the law. For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou should say, who shall go up? For us to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear and do it. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 30, 11 to 12. Now Baruch, who is uh, said to be Jeremiah's scribe in the book of Jeremiah, in the book of Baruch has this. Who has gone up to heaven and taken her and brought her down from the clouds? Who has gone over the sea and found her and will buy her for pure gold? It's Baruch 3, 29 to 30. Comparison with Baruch shows that the rejected object of the Deuteronomy passage was wisdom as represented by the tree of life in the temple. It's from the mother and the Lord. This is in Proverbs. She is the tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold fast to her are called happy. And she says in the great angel, the reform of Josiah the Deuteronomist then, reconstructed as best we can from both biblical and non-biblical sources, seems to have been a time when more than pagan accretions were removed from the Jerusalem cult. Wisdom was eliminated, even though her presence was never forgotten. The heavenly ascent and the vision of God were abandoned. The host of heaven, the angels, were declared unfit to be the, for the chosen people. The ark and the presence, presence of Yahweh, which it represented, was removed, and the role of the high priest was altered, and that he was no longer the anointed. All of these features of the older cult were to appear in Christianity. 
And she says, she points out the texts dealing with the Holy Ones and the Holy One have significant elements in common. Theophany, judgment, triumph for Yahweh, triumph for his anointed son, ascent to a throne in heaven, conflict with beasts and with angel princes caught up in the destinies of earthly kingdoms. Many of these texts are corrupted. Much of their subject matter is that of the lost tradition thought to underlie the apocalyptic texts. The textual corruption and the lost tradition are aspects of the same question. That's from uh, the Older Testament. Okay. And she says in The Great Angel, the exile in Babylon is a formidable barrier to anyone wanting to reconstruct religious beliefs and practices of, of ancient Jerusalem. Enormous developments took place in the wake of enormous destruction. Great Angel, page 12. So the Book of Mormon starts right there. In the commencement of the first year of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, my father Lehi, having dwelt at Jerusalem. First Nephi 1 introduces many of the things that the reformers condemned. Visions of the heavenly council, the hosts, the throne, the descent of the Holy One, the association of the stars and angels. Lehi's first public discourse manifested plainly that there will be a Messiah and the redemption of the world. This invited trouble because the reformers had changed the role of the high priest so that he was no longer the anointed, that is, the Messiah, and removed the Day of Atonement, which ritually enacts the redemption of the world. The reformers had destroyed the tree of life during Lehi's lifetime. When he leaves Jerusalem and enters the desert, he has his vision of the tree. Nephi also has the vision and the interpretation, as Daniel Peterson observed, associates the tree with the Virgin Mother of the Lord. Margaret Barker often refers to passages in 1 Enoch 93.7-8 that describe a condition and a time of blindness. And after that, in the fifth week, at its close, the house of glory and dominion shall be built forever. And after that, in the sixth week, all who live in it shall be blinded, and the heart of all them shall godlessly forsake wisdom. And in it shall a man ascend, and at its close, the house of dominion shall be burnt with fire, and the whole race of the chosen root shall be dispersed. Other prophets talk about the same blindness. Ezekiel, son of man, thou dwellest in the midst of a rebellious house, which have eyes to see and see not, and have ears to hear and hear not, for they are a rebellious house. Jeremiah, hear this now, foolish people, without understanding, which have eyes and see not, and have ears and hear not. It's Jeremiah 5. Zephaniah, and I will bring distress upon men that shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord. Isaiah 59, your iniquities have separated you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. We grope for the wall like the blind. Barker observes that the third Isaiah attacks those who advocate Deuteronomist ideals, that is, the returning exiles backed by Cyrus. Jacob also talks about it. Behold, the Jews that Lehi knew in Jerusalem in the period before the destruction were a stiff-necked people, and they despised the words of plainness, that is, concerning the Messiah and the, and the redemption of the world. That word plainness there goes back to 1 Nephi 19, where it says Lehi spoke plainly concerning a Messiah and the redemption of the world, and killed the prophets and sought for things which they could not understand. Wherefore, because of their blindness, which blindness came from looking beyond the mark, that is, the anointing of the high priest that designated and symbolized the Messiah as atoning Lord, they must needs fall. For God hath taken his plainness away from them and delivered unto them many things which they cannot understand because they desired it. Jacob 4.14. So, vision is the opposite of blindness. For who hath stood in the council of the council, the word there is sod for the divine council of the Lord, and hath perceived and heard his word. That's Jeremiah. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me. So Jeremiah is one who's seen. He also says, the Lord says to him, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty or hidden things which thou knowest not. That contradicts Jeremiah, uh, Deuteronomy. Ezekiel, and the man said unto me, Son of man, behold with thine eyes and hear with thine ears and set thine heart upon all that I will show thee. Ezekiel 440. Uh, Nephi, uh, well, this is actually talking about Jacob in 2 Nephi. Thou hast beheld in thy youth his glory. Jacob, for I have heard and seen. Lehi, uh, Lehi testified of the things which he saw and heard which made him a visionary man. And the great angel talks about, uh, there were many in the first century Palestine who still retained a worldview derived from the more ancient religion of Israel. 
that of the first temple, in which there was a high God and several sons of God, one of whom was Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel. Yahweh the Lord could be manifest on earth in human form as an angel or in the Davidic king. It was as a manifestation of Yahweh, the Son of God, that Jesus was acknowledged as Son of God, Messiah, and Lord. Jesus in the Gospels was described as a son of El Elyon, God Most High. <clears throat> Jesus is not called the Son of Yahweh, nor the Son of the Lord, but he is called Lord. And when Barker read the Book of Mormon and spoke about it in 2005 in Washington, D.C., she asked this question. Do the revelations to Joseph Smith fit in that context, the reign of King Zedekiah, who is mentioned at the beginning of the first book of Nephi? King Zedekiah was installed in Jerusalem in 597 BCE. I am not a scholar of Mormon texts and traditions, and I must emphasize that. I'm a biblical scholar specializing in the Old Testament. Until some Mormon scholars made contact with me a few years ago, I would never have considered using Mormon texts and traditions as part of my own work. Since that initial contact, I have had many good and fruitful exchanges and have begun to look at these texts very closely. I'm still, however, very much an amateur in this area. What I can offer can only be the reactions of an Old Testament scholar. Are the revelations to Joseph Smith consistent with the situation in Jerusalem about 600 BCE? And she says, um, <clears throat> the, she's talking about this, the tree of life made one happy according to the book of Proverbs, but for other detailed descriptions of the tree, we have to rely on the non-canonical texts. Enoch described it as perfumed with fruit like grapes, but a text discovered in Egypt in 1945 described the tree as beautiful, fiery, and with fruit like white grapes. I don't know of any other source which describes the fruit as white grapes. So you can imagine my surprise when I read the account of Lehi's vision of the tree whose white fruits made one happy, and the interpretation of the vision that the virgin in Nazareth was the mother of the Son of God after the manner of the flesh. This is the heavenly mother represented by the tree of life, and then Mary and her son on earth. This revelation to Joseph Smith was the exact ancient wisdom symbolism, intact and almost certainly as it was known in Jerusalem 600 BCE. Now, <clears throat> one of the more formidable criticisms of the Book of Mormon was David Wright's article in the Approaches on Melchizedek. And he says, if scholarship recognizes that Hebrews does not create all of its argument by itself, but relies on tradition and perhaps even on some unknown written sources, in addition to the Bible, in some of the places where we have seen the epistle parallel elements in Alma 12 to 13. But these traditions and sources are in general relatively recent developments for the author of Hebrews, not traditions going back 700 years. Moreover, the traditions and sources found or supposed by scholars for the passages in Hebrews relevant to Alma 12 to 13 are diverse. They are not likely to be found in one traditional source. And this is what Barker wrote <clears throat> six years before that. Melchizedek was central to the old royal cult. It is quite clear that this priesthood operated within the mythology of the sons of Elion and the triumph of the royal son of God in Jerusalem. We should expect later references to the Melchizedek to retain some memory of the cult of Elion. The role of the ancient kings was that of the Melchizedek figure in 11Q Milk, that is a pre the pre-Christian text from Qumran. This accounts for the Melchizedek material in Hebrews and the early church's association of Melchizedek and the Messiah. The arguments of Hebrews presuppose a knowledge of the angel mythology, which we no longer have. So contrary to right, the sources do go back 700 years and are unified in the first temple. And it turns out that Alma 13 is crowded with other first temple themes that received no notice whatsoever in Wright's discussion. Is the Book of Mormon too Christian before Christ? Alexander, Alexander Campbell in 1831, the Nephites, like their father for many generations, were good Christians, believers in the doctrines of the Calvinists and Methodists and preaching baptism and other Christian usages hundreds of years before Jesus Christ was born. And it turns out that most of the expansions hypothesized in Osler's 1987 expansion theory are based on the same concern. <clears throat> Barker's work undercuts this kind of critique by pointing back to the first temple as the root of Christianity. Christianity was heir to the temple tradition and so was by no means a new religion in the first century. Now, most scholars, including Barker, see the Book of Mormon or see the Book of Isaiah as containing writings from a first Isaiah dating from the time of Hezekiah, 100 years before Lehi, a second Isaiah writing during the exile, and a third Isaiah writing after the return. 
Barker wrote the Isaiah essay for Erdman's commentary on the Bible, which happened because of her Isaiah chapters in the Older Testament. So she works with the scholarly divisions of her second and third Isaiah and the idea of an Isaiah with students and disciples. She sees the second Isaiah as responding to the disasters of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in the exile. The second Isaiah declared that Yahweh was El Elyon and reformulated the theology towards strict monotheism. However, the Isaiah chapters in which this argument is made, chapters 40 to 47, do not appear in the Book of Mormon, in which Yahweh is the son of El Elyon, God Most High, in 1 Nephi 11, 6. Barker has also made the case that Isaiah 53, the suffering servant song, was composed during the reign of Hezekiah in response to Hezekiah's bout with the plague and against the background of the Day of Atonement ritual. See here I say the original context of the fourth servant song, and that makes that particular Isaiah chapter available to Abinadi via the brass plates. And at a 2016 fair conference, she claimed that all four servant songs were composed by Isaiah of Jerusalem. She also argues that the third Isaiah directly opposes the Deuteronomists. I'm talking about the Heavenly Mother, and she says it is bad practice to reconstruct the male God of Israel from the biblical texts and the female from the archaeological evidence, as this gives the impression that the lady cannot be found in the written sources. The correspondence between the Great Lady of Ugarit and the Lost Lady of Jerusalem is, however, striking, as we shall see that the Lady of Jerusalem was described as a winged sun deity, the mother of the king named the morning star, and the mother of the sons of El, that is, the angels. The advantage of having archaeological evidence to support a hypothesis constructed from texts is that archaeological evidence is less likely to have been edited, although the archaeological reports from the first half of the last century show that numbers of these figurines were discarded as rubbish because they had no possible relevance to biblical archaeology. That's uh, from Temple Theology. So, Barker and the Latter-day Saints. And the first quotations were from the Great Angel in the mid-90s. Uh, the Farms Review had some, Big Morris Restoring the Ancient Church, several other essays. First direct contact was me in 1999. My study in Paradigms Regained came out in 2002, and then Noel Reynolds visited her. She joined with my response to the New, Mor New Mormon Challenge in the, the Review 14, 1 and 2. Uh, she came to BOU for a week-long seminar. And in conversation with John Fedness and Lou Midgley reported that as a student at Cambridge, she had read Christian Envy of the Temple by Hugh Nibley. At the Joseph Smith Conference, she openly spoke on the Book of Mormon. There's been much contact and collaboration since, notably several SBL meetings on LDS topics, on the Tree of Life, on Enoch, on Melchizedek, on Nibley. On six, and there were uh, several successful temple studies groups, uh, meetings in London and Logan up until COVID. Uh, several books and essays. She had John Welsh do the Sermon on the Mountain Light of the Temple. 2016, she came to Fair in Provo and spoke to almost a thousand listeners on the Heavenly Mother and her children. Many LDS scholars use her work, including Grant Gardner, John Welch, Steve Ricks, John Fitness, Barry Bigmore, David Larson, Robert Boylan, M. Catherine Thomas, Allison von Felton, Zina Nibley Peterson, Jeffrey Bradshaw, Daniel Peterson, Val Larson, Neil Rapley, Joe Spencer, and others. And she's filled featured in the LDS Temples Through Time video, speaking first after a modern apostle and last before he closes. And she's got a few critics, and there's notably a guest edited BYU study in 2021, and I did respond at length and in detail to that. So <clears throat> Barker is aware that she is proposing a new paradigm against recent scholarship that has been of little help to the life and faith of the church. In fact, the ex very opposite. We have witnessed the extraordinary phenomenon of people who spend their lives studying something they are bent on destroying and passing on, yea, insisting similar attitudes in their students. The Jesus Seminar is a good example. She says, the current paradigm is going towards a non-faith-based study, which has no future. By this, I do not simply mean that study is not faith-based. It is based on non-faith, and so criticism does not mean close study. It so often means destructive study. New paradigms emerge from those aware of this crisis who recognize that the situation is not likely to be remedied by the methods that caused it. What she offers is an approach that reveals that the Jesus of history is the Christ of faith. Okay, there's that. And then uh, I will stop my share and come back. 
Oh, no, that was really, really informative. I do appreciate it. And one of the questions I had in the back of my head was like, um, because you mentioned Isaiah and Turin Isaiah to start before you went to your slides. It's like, I should ask him about her scholarship and do true, try to Isaiah, but you kind of touched upon it. Like her article in the original saying for the fourth servant hymn, which is Isaiah 52, 13 to 53, 12, which he's yeah. more or less quoting Mosiah 14 by Abinadi and Mosiah 15 sees exposition yeah. of it. Right. Now actually belongs to a proto-Isaiah corpus. Although I believe she herself does not believe in the unity of all 66 chapters. She just believes uh -huh. that some chapters should be in proto as opposed to deutero corpus. Yeah, she she kind of follows that. But And when I read uh, the Older Testament, that was the, the thing that really struck me was that she'd made this argument based on these chapters that weren't in the Book of Mormon. So the, I don't think the Isaiah situation is completely resolved, but um, I don't think we should just, you know, pack up our tents and say, well, that's, you know, that's kryptonite for us. We can't deal with it. I, okay. I think there's, there's, I know there's a range of LDS responses. And uh, I think mine is kind of, you know, mine's gone her direction just because I, I find it fruitful and promising. There's and there's some interesting stuff. I think some of the stuff we have in the Book of Mormon, you know, it's it's a translation into our culture according to our learning. So um, I don't have a problem with it, uh, even using some of the language that you know may have been worked on, worked over by an exilic Isaiah. It's for us, and it points us in the right direction. But I don't think we have, you know, I think we can imagine, well, you know, we could... Uh, there's there's a passage in in uh, Doctrine and Covenants section 128 where Joseph Smith is saying, well, this this translation is sufficiently plain for my purpose as it stands. And I think if we had take that attitude to our reading of the scriptures, we don't have to agonize over. Well, it's not exactly perfect. It's not what I want from an inspired translation. You know, it's, well, you're not the one who gave us the inspired translation. That was Joseph Smith and God, and they've got a different agenda than you do. You know, you have we have to just step back and. If we've got room for that, then we've got some wiggle room. And then if we're not focused on what looks to us like a flaw, and we see the bigger picture, and I think that's uh, over and over I see that there's that tendency. You know, it's nibbly or talked about how the big picture is thousands and thousands of images, and you can take some, you know, mess with some of the pixels and still have the same basic picture. So uh, I think that's one of the reasons I think that's one of the reasons that I write the way that I do is I'm trying to be a big picture scholar since I don't have the uh, specialized techniques to do <laughs> some of the detail stuff. But uh, the big picture is helpful in dealing yeah, with details. Yeah, like um, one topic um, I've done work on here and there, like over the last couple of years, like see the Isaiah variants in the Book of Mormon, like uh, going through like David Wright's work and John Trentness's work. Yeah. How do you believe like, that kind of reminds me, like there should be like a balance between like it being a sufficient translation and like something more going on beyond the surface. I like what Brant Garner and his commentaries. Yes. Um, yeah. He's famous, yes. like, say, the use of the Bible in the Book of Mormon. He's a uh, kind of comes to mind as well. But like for those who are wondering about, like, say, Second Isaiah in the Book of Mormon, um, at the BH Roberts Foundation, we do have an article and research on the topic. Um, so if you go on mormonor.org and kind of go down like the hard questions, it will be there. And there's going to be like a huge project in Book of Mormon anachronisms coming out real soon as well. So be on outlook for that. But yeah. sorry, I had to do the up like my workplace. But um, <laughs> so um, why I can understand like say maybe like amongst like so-called mainstream or uppercase O or lowercase O orthodox Christians, there would be like some kind of pushback in Sparker because, you know, she kind of assumes like Josiah was not the good guy contra the biblical texts or these yeah. second kings and if you believe, like, say, the Bible is taking up new styles in its totality, that can't be the case. So I understand, like, say, the um, pushback. But um, what do you think, like, there's been some pushback by Latter-day Saints? I mean, like, I'm sometimes critical of her work, but, like, I kind of see, like, some people who have never read her work kind of think she's nuts. So, and among some of the more academic Latter-day Saints who are critical of her, um, why do you think there's sometimes this kind of a knee-jerk reaction? Because, you know, we're not inerrantists. Um, we do believe, like, you know, any scripture, not just the Bible, is prone to the works of uh, human errors and stuff like that. So a priori, it should not really be uh, uh, an issue necessarily with us. But why do you think no. there's sometimes like this kind of um, knee-jerk I, think, I think, well, it's one of the reasons why I use Thomas Kuhn so much in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, is that uh, scholarship works in schools where people are taught using standard examples, standard approaches. So that's ingrained and, and you're taught in the textbooks and your examples and say, this is how we do scholarship. You know, like say, you know, 
like uh, Richard Elliott Friedman's Who Wrote the Bible, you know, which is, it's a, it's a good introduction to the documentary hypothesis. People go to school, they're taught that, they see that way. They're surrounded by people who see that way. And it's just, people get socialized into a way of thinking that they can't see as a way of thinking. They think it's just the way things are. And I think, uh, you know, when Joseph Smith talks about, uh, you know, the Latter-day Saints, you know, that if he, <laughs> people just have a hard time getting past the traditional way of thinking things, uh, there's there's personality temperament. There's uh, the thing called the uh, uh, the Perry Scheme uh, for uh, cognitive uh, cognitive and ethical growth growth that I use a lot. There's, there's different ways of, there's temperament, there's training, there's just socialization. I think some people just get in, you know, they'll, they'll look around and say, well, here's something, and what should I think of that? So they'll ask an expert and the expert will, you know, just poo poo it. But there's not a real critical response. You know, the, the BYU studies article, you know, if you, if you look at what he actually says, how he actually engages her work, he doesn't doesn't engage my work either for that matter they just kind of give reasons for not looking at it rather than looking at it so the difference between ideological dismissal and paradigm comparison is that for ideological dismissal that they can dismiss barker by saying well that's not us a paradigm comparison means you got to say why us you got to step back look at the beam in your own eye and say what's going on here you have to understand it and then you have to look back and forth and say well, is it testable? Uh, can you? What are the accuracy of its key predictions? If you try it on for size, is it fruitful? You start seeing things that you never would have seen otherwise. What's the breadth and depth of the explanation? How well does it fit with everything else we think we know? And what's the future promise? And if somebody isn't doing that, then what what you're getting is ideological dismissal. I mean, that's you know that's when, you, when the evangelicals do it. They'll sometimes they'll say, "Well, she's just not us," and then they'll they'll rush off with just a bunch of declarations of what their training says. These are the key passages, and these are the key approaches, and that's all you need to know. But there's no real comparison, and it's so. Even though I haven't had uh, you know formal PhD training, and you know, I'm just to be in English. Uh, I didn't have any trouble taking on, say, that BYU studies article because, quite frankly, he didn't really give any arguments that were challenging. It was more ideological dismissal based on an insider's view saying, this is the inside view, she's outside. Well, that's easy to do, but it's not the same thing as doing a real paradigm comparison. If they did that, it might be harder for me, but they don't. So I can do it because I can say, here's what they say, and here's you know what this other information provides. And uh, sometimes it's just, I, I'm a little embarrassed for them sometimes because it just seems like it's it's more based on, on social conditioning rather than a genuine inquiry. I have to say that, and I, I think this is what I've got in print demonstrates it. No, that's cool. And you kind of mentioned Thomas Kuhn's book, The um, Structures of Scientific Revolution. Um, yeah, yeah I, I think everyone should read that book. It's it's excellent. Um, but terms in terms of, say, book, because Barker has written like a lot of books and a lot of articles. 19 um, books. Yeah, this. so if someone wants to like start going into your scholarship, you know, um, of course, like they should read The Great Angel because everyone references that. Yeah. But uh, do you think that should be the book everyone begins with? Or do you think- that It depends. Um, most of the people that, started, you know, most of the LDS scholars did start with Great Angel. And I've heard five different top LDS scholars, you know, people with the degrees, all gave me the same one word review of this book independently. They all said, wow. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's Daniel Peterson. That's uh, Steve Ricks. That's John Tvednish. You know, that's people like that. They just all said, wow. But if and but they're all nibliophiles. They're all people who who've got you know a certain amount of background and kind of know what the source is because you know M Margaret doesn't she doesn't wait for you to catch up. She's like nibbly in that way. She's she's off and running, uh, at least in that book. But there's books like uh, Temple Theology. It's just you know the little hundred page book that's designed as an introduction. That's a good place for if you don't have the background. That's the best place to start. And that was really also, a couple of years ago by T T Clark. Yeah. Yeah. Also, just uh, she's got a website with uh, lots and lots of articles, and uh, every single one of them 
is of direct relevance to Latter-day Saint scripture. That's at margaretbarker.com, and there's the, the papers section. It also lists all of her books, but just like uh, one of the papers I recommend to people is she has one called Text and Context, which is her study of how the Old Testament scriptures were transmitted through time and what happened to them along the way. And what's to me, what's extraordinary is, is uh, well, she, 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 she presented that material at BYU on, on the Wednesday when she was here for a week. And uh, Jack Welch was kind of sitting up on the back row. And, you know, when I first talked to him at the start of the week, he's kind of guarded and reserved the way he is. And after that presentation of the material in text and context about how the scriptures were transmitted, he kind of bounded down to the front like a gazelle. And they'd given her like a triple combination, you know, monogrammed. And he popped it open to First Nephi and he just started saying, have you read that? You know, First Nephi 13, have you read this? Have you read this? Because they tell the same story about the loss and restoration of plain and precious things. You know, so I think something like that, you, you'll get a picture of, of uh, how we got the scriptures that, you know, for me, I think it's mind blowing. Plus, just uh, she's she just makes such good sense all the time. Um, she has like articles on uh, she has one on called belonging in the temple or, or now I see there's, you know, there's preaching, there's there's a couple of dozen videos, you know, if you just want to watch your talk, you know, I, I, you know, I like to watch your talk, but, you know, I prefer books myself because then I can, I can look at footnotes. I can mark things up. I can you know, know where things are coming from. I can make connections better that way. But at the same time, um, when we went to Yonkers, uh, my wife had been listening to me, you know, talk about this stuff for years. And she, she'd been with me before to see Margaret, but <clears throat> there Margaret was talking to these Orthodox priests about the temple and how that helps you understand Christ. And my wife, that was the one that really got to her. You know, after she heard just that talk, she just went up to Margaret. She had tears in her eyes and she just said, we have no idea what we have. So there's that. Um, there are lots of places to start if you have an interest. Um, I think there are things like, um, like well, with the book uh, Temple Theology, um, Joe Spencer in his little book uh, on, uh, on the Book of Mormon uh, and other Testament, he's got a section in there where he goes through and looks at first Nephi. And he says, uh, he says that the overall first and second Nephi are structured in a way that says it's a uh, creation, fall, covenant, um, vision, you know, something basically like that. And he, he can show how that's how first and second, first and second Nephi are structured overall. But then he goes and looks at the very first verse and he says, I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents, that's creation, having suffered many afflictions in the course of my days, that's the fall, nevertheless being blessed. You know, he goes on like that and he shows that the, the that passage basically gives the structure of a preview of the structure of first and second Nephi. And then uh, he was impressed because when he read uh, Temple Theology, he saw that the chapters and the whole structure was exactly the same. And he said he'd been working on this approach for years, and yet here it is in one of her books. So I think uh, I think just reading your work, you know, at one point, uh, Jeff Lindsay was asking me about some of the quotes I was using just, just from her books when I was kind of going through her career in the first part of 20 years after Paradigms Regained. He said, do you need to explain some of this more? And I said, no, I think it'd take a pretty obtuse reader not to see the relevance. You know, if I'm just quoting something from, you know, several of her key books and articles, and you see where she's going to go with this stuff. I don't know how you could not be excited because it seems to me it's just obvious. No, oh, that's cool. Uh, before we kind of end things, um, are you working on anything, or do you know Barker's working on anything at the moment? Um, well, I know she's working on her book. On uh, she had you know a health crisis a few months ago, she's, so she's kind of slowed down, but she's she's doing okay now. Um, She's working on a, a book on the Jordan, uh, the Jordan books, and I know those are very controversial. And indeed, some of the bloggers that have spoken out against the Jordan books have been LDS, um, which is kind of interesting too. But at the same time, she says they, they may be you know copies of originals, but she sees them as going back to uh, the time of Isaiah in the first temple. And I, I think it's real interesting what she's come up with. There's a, a very good presentation at the Academy for Temple Studies. That's, that's the Logan organization where she explains that. And that's kind of a preview of where things will be going. Um, from myself, uh, I did a review 
uh, for interpreter a few months ago of the first uh, the first <clears throat> response to uh, Grant Hardy's annotated Book of Mormon, which I think is it's a wonderful book and great tool. Uh, but at the same time, his basic approach was to defer to biblical scholarship and the you know mainstream conclusions. And since we're not mainstream, there's going to be some tension. So I just sent off another thirty thousand words. Uh, to interpreter to see about you know that going in. So that's currently with the editors, and we'll see what happens to it. Cool. I look forward to reading this. So that's good. But uh, yeah, thanks again for Kevin. Really do appreciate you coming on and giving, like, say, the pro Burger Barker side of things. Okay. Um, it's it's always my pleasure. Yeah. Uh, well, really do appreciate your time, and also a link to the previous episode you were on with me uh, just over a year ago, where you uh, give an overview of your response to Dan Vogel, Truth and Method. Kind of okay. apropos because he's kind of going on the live stream as we speak now, uh, critiquing uh, the Book of Mormon again. So uh, that'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But yeah, really thanks for coming on. And I really do appreciate it. And uh, I do look forward to reading your um, the link to yes, you've just made the interpreter once it gets uh, published. So okay. yeah, well, I look forward to seeing more of your work because you know, you're one of the good ones. So <laughs> Some would dispute that, but thank you. No, yeah. well, no it's, it's, it's good stuff. I, I like seeing what you've done. And I'm excited that you're working that you told me you were working on some of John Tvedness's material to bring that to light. So Yeah. Um yeah. I came across yeah, for, I came across like he's uh, unpublished Old Testament notes he taught uh used when he was teaching seminary or institute. So um I gave him the Jeff Bradshaw to see what he wants to do. Hi doggy. But uh yeah, so um and also like some other stuff. Um I came across like he's the unpublished few chapters of his book on textual criticism of the Bible. So I'm trying to track down the entirety of the manuscript um as well. So yeah, I think uh, it's in good hands. So I, I was really excited when you told me you're doing that because I, you know, I'd be kind of worried about some of his stuff. He said he had a book, uh, a project called uh, Ancient Texts and Mormonism, or, or something uh, like Mormon that. in the Ancient World, Joseph Smith in the Ancient Yeah, world. Joseph Smith in the Ancient World. Yeah, that that hadn't uh, seen print. So I'm glad that that you're working on that. Yeah. So, well, hopefully that will see the light of day sometime, and it won't take one eternal round. But uh, with that, thanks again, Kevin, for coming on. Really do appreciate it. And okay. um, hopefully we'll have you on again in the near future as well, because oh. there's some other topic. But until then, uh, take care, and thanks again. Okay, thank you. Okay, folks, uh, that was the live stream by Kevin Christensen. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, Yes, when he was when he said Orthodox in Yonkers, he, he means Eastern Orthodox. I believe it's the Russian uh, Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia, Rokor. But yeah, Orthodox is in Eastern Orthodox, where she spoke in Yonkers. Uh, just a reminder: tomorrow, probably at five PM Utah time, I will have the review of the Trent Horn James White debate on Sola Scriptura. Um, I might be joined by a Baptist um, who is looking into Mormon claims. Um, might actually have two as well. But beyond that, I'll, I'll look for that. I think I might be joined by Travis Anderson and or Sarah Allen discuss that as well. And in the unlikely case, someone actually knows Trent Horn's contact. Uh, if you want to make him aware of this, if he wants to come on, uh, he can as well. Not going to happen. But as I said, um, that was a pro uh, pro Margaret Barker con Deuteronomistic reform episode. Hopefully sometime later this year, I will have the other side of the kind an informed person, in this case, a BYU professor, who is critical of Barker, um, who actually doesn't know his stuff when it comes to the book of Deuteronomy as well, will be um, coming on as well, so just to get a, a balance there. But I hope you enjoyed the episode. And as I said, there'll be a stream tomorrow reviewing the Solo Scriptura debate from last week, 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Um, I might change that to 4 p.m. or 6 p.m. because I do have an important phone call in the evening, but you'll see the announcement. And until then, live long and prosper.